<laughs> um, hello. Welcome back to my Final Fantasy VII first playthrough. Um, I'm sorry for the late stream. Um, and I'm sorry that I didn't shave. I normally shave before I stream, but I'm running late, so I, I didn't bother this time. Um, so I, I went back and looked up a, a guide to make sure that everything was in order with the material that I already have. And uh, as it turns out, there's still at least two more material for me to get here. And uh, guess what the fastest way of earning enough GP in order to buy those items is? Chocobo racing! Yay! Get ready for more Chocobo racing, guys! Yay! Except we're not going to do that here. <laughs> We're, uh, we're not gonna do that just yet. Yeah, I, I don't want my content to be too repetitive since I just did Chocobo Racing uh, a couple of streams ago, so... What we're gonna do instead today is uh, actually grind for our Limit Break kills. And uh, while we're doing that, we might as well, you know, level up our Materia as alongside of that. So I'm actually going to unequip everybody's materia real quick and then rearrange it just so I can be sure that and I'll, I'll leave and then change party members in order to That was something that I wanted to do um, back when I was doing the Battle Square battles, but I always, always forgot. I'm pretty sure everybody else doesn't have materia equipped, but I need to be sure of it. Alright, we're gonna do Kate's. Uh, Limit breaks first because uh, he only has two, and uh, Pretty sure what the speedrunners do is uh, they equip attack all or, or slash all, mega all, whatever it is, onto the person who has the berserk ring on, and that pretty much just makes it so that way uh, they automatically kill all of the weak enemies, and I don't need to do anything, and that's the fastest way to farm uh, the Limit Break kills. I hope my, my setup is correct. I, I, I could be wrong.
Then I... Okay, I guess I was mistaken. I was so sure that I got Cloud's uh, triple materia growth weapon, but... Yeah, I, I was obviously mistaken. Speaking of mithril caves, apparently uh, another materia that I missed somehow, um, the, the, uh, long range materia, somewhere in these caves, but I missed them, even though I've been here before, and I'm pretty sure I may have missed it because I, I didn't feel like attacking. Or rather, exploring earlier in the game because I didn't want to risk dying. But now that I'm completely over level for this area, I have no problem with exploring more thoroughly since I can easily destroy any enemies that I encounter. I'm not sure why Kate says not. Okay, see, I, I've been here before. I'm pretty sure I, I did explore this room. First time I was here. There we go. Yeah, see, I already got this chest. Oh, I didn't climb up here, though. And there we go, long range materia. Yay! Probably give him this instead of me. Oh, actually, he doesn't need it, so. Climb this vine. All right, now we can start properly grinding. Really? 
not sure how many more uh, kills that uh I'm not sure how many kills Kate Sith already got on his own before I, I, I started this, but it couldn't have been that many since I barely ever used him. But you know, however many I got, that I'll cut down on how many battles I have to do here. You guys liking what you're seeing so far? I hope you do, because this is all that I'm going to be doing for pretty much this entire stream. This and, and farming uh, limit break uses as well, once I've done uh, farming the kills. Just to be sure, I do have uh, enemy lore. And sneak attack equipped. Okay. Since there's absolutely nothing else to talk about while doing this stuff. I mean, at least with Chocobo Racing, you know, there was, uh, there was stuff to talk about with regards to actually, like, raising a Chocobo and the work involved with getting the items and, and stuff like that, but, uh, here, what is there to say? Oh, I, I got into another battle. Oh, I got, I got, you know, oh, he killed them all instantly, yay. And, and then you do it again, and again, and again, and again, so, you know, there's just nothing to talk about. So, what I decided to do instead is, I decided since I am a Marvel fanboy and that, yes. All right, see? I knew that was going to be fast because he, he's only got one limit break, so... <laughs> I'm glad that happened on my way out, so now I can instantly change my party members. Uh, you know what, let's do Barrett next because he's been around since the beginning, so he deserves to get it next. Oh, wait, I didn't unequip Kate Sits material. Probably be a better idea to have. Whoops. Enemy lure and sneak attack on Cloud instead. Oh. Perhaps that's what I need to. Okay. You know what, I will keep enemy lure on him, but uh... What happened to... Where's sneak attack? There it is, okay. You know what, screw it, uh, I'll just keep it on whoever's actually grinding their limits. So as I was saying, uh, I, I am a Marvel fanboy, and uh, talking about the Marvel movies uh, in my YouTube videos is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've procrastinated for far too long, uh, you know, actually doing my reviews of the MCU Marvel films that I've been wanting to do. So I decided this would be a good opportunity, since there's nothing else to talk about, for me to actually discuss the Marvel movies. Uh, these aren't 
obviously going to be full length reviews like what I want to do on YouTube, but uh still, um I will give my general thoughts, what I think about the movies, what I like about them, etc. Uh as I do this, since as I said, there is pretty much nothing else to talk about during uh this grinding that I'm gonna be doing. Oh wait, I didn't put the room on it. Right on. Where's the... Oh, I was supposed to take it off of Kate Sith and then swap it out. Should all be good now, right? Uh, that's whatever. All right, now let's save since I've already got somebody's final limit break. All right. So, like I was saying, uh, so these thoughts on Marvel movies that I'm going to be giving. Uh, I initially was going to do them in the order that I liked them from the most to least, but uh, I actually can't remember off the top of my head what the uh, order I liked them in the most is anymore since the, over the last two years the list has changed a lot. Well, maybe not a lot, but enough that I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what the order is. So. It would be best for me to just talk about the movies in order that they were released. So, which of course would be the first Iron Man movie, and... The, the movie certainly is lacking when it comes to action scenes and stuff like that, but... What makes up for it is how strong the story is. It's basically a story of redemption, you know. A man is a war profiteer, billionaire, who doesn't really take it what he's doing into account and really only cares about how it benefits him, but then he is harmed by his own weapons and realizes the damage that he's been doing from his business and decides to change his ways and reform himself. It's a typical redemption story. And you know, how his character development is really what makes the move. It doesn't really matter that there's not much action in the film. It's the story it tells that makes it so uh, gripping to uh, watch. And, you know, I never see that movie discussed when it comes to superhero movies that are so good that even people who don't like superhero movies could enjoy them. And I honestly think that's a bit unfair to this movie in particular because I honestly think it is good enough to be worthy of that discussion. Um, the only real weak point of the film, I would say, is the villain, and that is probably why the, the, the movie isn't really discussed when it comes to superhero films that are uh, good enough to be enjoyed by non-superhero fans. You know, and admittedly, the villain is probably the weakest part of the film, but I, I also think that he's not as weak as people give him credit for. Like, I actually think he had potential to be a, a much better villain than he is, you know. Like, certainly... Like... I feel like his relationship with Tony Stark would have made... I don't know. They, they could have just changed some things about it and it would have made more sense for him to... Uh, his motivations could, could have been sympathetic if they just changed a few things about his character. Or rather, you know, 
like how things were supposed to happen with regards to his business and, and stuff like that. But uh, it is what it is. I don't think he's a terrible villain by any means, just lacking in a certain crucial areas. And uh, the next movie that was released in the MCU, although I'm sure many people don't realize it's an MCU film, is The Incredible Hulk, which is not a sequel to Ang Lee's Hulk movie. Although, certainly with the way that the story begins, it certainly could be one. Like, uh, you know, Ang Lee's Hulk movie basically ends with him hiding out from the military in uh, South America, I think it is. And uh, that's pretty much where the story of the Incredible Hulk begins. You know, he's hiding out from the government in, in South America, and that's actually a pretty interesting way of having that movie be a continuation of a film it's not actually a sequel to. And, you know, it's... This movie is different from other MCU films. It was made by Universal and not Marvel Studios. You know, it's not really ever called back to in any other MCU films, so it's hardly connected at all. Really, the, the strongest connection this movie has to the rest of the MCU is Tony Stark's appearance at the end of the film, as well as the fact that uh, the same actor who plays General Thunderbolt Ross in this movie was reprises his role in, his, in later appearances, so that's pretty much all the connections to the MCU that this movie has. I mean, don't get me wrong, satellite game, game. yes, I'm getting there. Um, it's certainly, it's definitely part of the MCU, but uh, it certainly doesn't feel like it, and understand. it's under, easy to understand why, but as for the actual quality of the movie, um, some people would say it's just okay, while others would say it's the worst MCU film, and I honestly wouldn't blame you for thinking that, but, I mean, again, it, it was made by Universal and not Marvel, so it's easy to understand why you would think it's of lower quality than the rest of the films, but I think it's, I don't think it's the, the worst MCU film. It certainly ranks low, like near the bottom of the list, but I don't think it is the worst. I could, at the same time, I could also see why some people would think it's just okay. You know, it's certainly not mind-blowingly amazing or anything like that. I actually think that the uh, story it tells has a lot of potential to be very great, but Again, it's one of those things that the potential is there, it just doesn't live up to its maximum potential. But, you know, it's fine. Like, it won't blow your mind or anything like that. I, at the very least, I don't think you won't think it's a waste of time to watch. It's, you know, the effects are not bad, but they're not... Like, they're not the best, but they're not bad either, you know. Um, actually, if there's anything that I, I will hold against this movie, it, it's that I, I don't think Edward Norton is a, a good Bruce Banner. Like, had it not been for Eric Banner's performance in Angry's Hulk movie, I think Edward Norton would be the worst Bruce Banner. Excuse me. I mean, granted... Okay, so Eric Banner's performance in Ang Lee's Hulk movie is really... I would blame it on the direction more than his acting abilities. So, by technicality, I would consider <laughs> uh, Edward Norton to be the worst Bruce Banner. But uh, that's really the only thing about the film that I outright dislike about it, other than the fact that they set up for the leader to appear in a future film, and that ends up never paying off. Well, th there is a She-Hulk TV show coming to Disney Plus soon, so maybe it could finally pay off? Who knows, but uh... I would say The Incredible Hulk is a film that's... 
It's certainly not necessary to watch. Like, you can understand the story just fine having not watched it. It's really up to you, but I would only recommend it for the absolute most diehard of Marvel or MCU fans. And with that out of the way, we have Iron Man 2. And, uh... I said before, I just said that I don't think Incredible Hulk is the worst MCU film. I think Iron Man 2 is the worst MCU film. I mean, don't get me wrong, the film does do some things right, like... I like the dialogue in particular, like, for some reason I find the movie to be incredibly quotable. Like, I absolutely love the dialogue and character interaction in this movie, despite the fact that I don't like the movie itself that much. Because, really, when it, what it comes down to is that the film is just boring. Like, almost the entire time I'm watching it, I'm just waiting for something to happen, and most of the film is just people talking. Now, I did also just say that Iron Man 1 didn't have much action in it either, so what's the difference between that movie and Iron Man 2? The difference is that Iron Man 2 sucks because the story's not good. So, the lack of action is not made up for with a good story. It, it introduces a lot of conflicts and things that need to be resolved, but all of them have no lasting impact whatsoever. Like, oh, Tony, he's being poisoned by palladium. You know, he, need, he, he needs to find a cure. Oh, it cures him completely. There's no lasting effects of the palladium poisoning, okay? The villain, you know, he comes in, you know, he's pretty much dealt with in the film he's introduced in, like most of these, like in most of these movies, and there's pretty much, like, nothing matters in this movie, because everything that, that, ha <laughs> everything that, that brings conflict that gets brought into this movie is immediately dealt with and taken out, and... Yeah, there's, there's just nothing matters, because there's no lasting impact of any of it. Uh, okay, okay. War Machine is introduced, he's a recurring character, you know, so, you know, Black Widow's introduced, she's a recurring character, so, yeah, okay, their introductions do matter, they, they, they have a lasting impact, but everything else, like, and again, Really, the only thing that keeps the movie from being completely boring for me is the fact that I enjoy the dialogue so much. So, that's the only reason I, I can think of to ever rewatch the film because I like the dialogue and character interactions, and that's pretty much it. I can't really think of anything else. I mean, yes, it does have its moments, but other than the dialogue, I, I really just. I'd rather watch any other MCU film, even The Incredible Hulk. And, uh, well, I, I'm not sure about the other quote-unquote worst MCU film, but still, Iron Man 2 is the uh, MCU film I would say I enjoy the least. Uh, um, what was the next one after that? Oh yeah, it was Thor, I believe, that, that came out after Iron Man 2, and it's much better than Iron Man 2. <laughs> I'll say that much. A lot of people consider th this movie to be boring or bad or whatever. Uh, hold on, let me just... Whoops, that's not what I wanted to check. Um... Alright, well, I'll, I'll keep going for a little while longer. So like I said, um, I'm not sure why people don't like the first Thor movie, but because honestly, again, I, I think it's one of those movies where, and I don't really think the first Thor movie has a lack of action. Certainly, uh, there's more action in it than Iron Man 2, that's for sure. But I would consider it to be another movie where the story is what makes it a good film. Sure, it's not the best, but I would consider it to be one of the best of Phase 1 at least. You know what I mean? Like... It's another redemption story, basically. 
Thor causes problems for his family by doing something that he shouldn't have. Like, his rash actions basically start another war with a race of people that his, his own people have been friendly with for a very long time, and because of this, Odin banishes him to Earth, and he has to redeem himself in order for himself to become worthy enough to be called Thor. You know, so again, it's a story of redemption, a story of learning, a story of character development, and that's what makes it so great to watch, in my opinion. So again, I'm not sure what people aren't seeing in this movie that makes it boring for them, or otherwise not like it. it it's a fine film, in my opinion, just not one of the best. It's not mind-blowingly epic or anything like that, just a solid film, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, there, there's there's a couple of moments of humor here or there, but it doesn't... Certainly, there, there are some characters that, that could have been more important than they were, like... You know, the, the Warriors 3, I think they're, they're called. Certainly, you know, they could have been... Yeah, Lady Sif and the Warriors 3. They, they could have had more to do in the story, certainly, beyond... Um, the initial battle at Jotunheim, but uh, and yeah, the, the, the Earth characters, alright, I'm okay with Eric Selvig and I can tolerate Jane Foster, but I don't necessarily dislike, I don't even remember the character's name, she's played by Kat Dennings, I don't dislike the character necessarily, I, I just don't tolerate her exactly like like I do Jane Foster you know again I don't I don't really dislike any of the earth characters they're just not as good or interesting as the ones from Asgard in my opinion I'm gonna look this up real quick I'm pretty sure that's all I had to say about, uh, Thor 1, you know, generally speaking, of course. Um, Captain America is the next film, and... This is another film that I would say it's good, just not mind-blowingly good, like... Certainly, you won't consider it a waste of time to, to watch the movie, but it definitely could have been better. Just, but, the ways it could have been better is basically, like, you would have to change. Honestly, I think the film is fine as it is, it's just, I don't know. It's one of those things where it's good enough as it is, but you know it could be better, and you're just not... Well, I should say, I'm not sure how it could be better. I'm sure there's a lot of people who you could talk to, and they could give many ways in which the film could have been better than it is, you know, regardless of whether or not you would need to make... Excuse me. Smaller, big changes to the movie itself. Um, this is actually not a redemption story like the others. Uh, Steve Rogers is basically a huge patriot, loves his country and all that, and, uh... Okay. So I am, in fact, done with Barrett's farming. So yeah, like I was saying, um, the movie, instead of Steve Rogers redeeming himself, he's pretty much rewarded with uh, being a patriot by, uh, like he's given the super serum soldier so that way he can uh, become Captain America and he has to fight against the Red Skull which is the, the leader of this uh, Nazi group called Hydra, 
although they branched off and, uh, you know, started doing their own thing after the Red Skull got his hands on the Tesseract. worried there for a second. I, I thought I didn't take the, the Fury Ring off of Barrett. Um, God, I'm losing my train of thought here. What was, what, what was I saying? Because the Super Serum Soldier uh, enhances uh, not just the strength of the person uh, who, who the Serum is given to, but also their personality, uh, that is why scientists who created the serum wanted to that's why the creator of the super 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 soldier serum wanted to, to give it to Steve Rogers because it, it, his patriotism and sense of justice uh, it works better if on a person like him, then, then say, oh, music glitch. Yeah, that. Oh, the, the music fixed itself. Uh, God, I, I, I'm, I'm all over the place with this commentary right now. Um, <sighs> the, the Red Skull was given the Super Soldier Serum first. Thus, you know, aside from enhancing his strength and everything, he also uh, became a much worse person than he already was. And then, so in order to combat that, they're giving Steve, Steve Rogers a huge patriot with a sense of justice. Um, the super serious soldier in order to combat that, since he's the perfect contrast and counter to that, that sort of person. So rather than being a story of redemption, it's a story of, you know... I, I'm not... I know there's a, a, a name for this type of story, I, I just... it's not coming to me right now. Um, certainly a smarter person than me would, would, would have already said it, but... I, I still think it, it, it's a good story nonetheless. Certainly, it's not as satisfying to, to watch as somebody redeeming themselves for their misdeeds or what have you, but nonetheless, it's a satisfying story to, to watch anyway, and, uh... Oh yeah, I actually think I, I know what kind of story that describes Captain America, the, the first Avenger, because, uh... After he's initially given the, the Super Serum Soldier, he's he's thought of by his government uh, as a means to promote the war rather than actually fight in it. But he wants to, you know, actually fight in the war so he could actually serve his country rather than just doing so superficially, you know. So it's a story of, about him proving himself, proving his worth, you know what I mean? Pulling his weight and, and stuff like that. And, you know, certainly the movie doesn't end on a happy note, but at the same time, you know, it, it's a good thing that he's still alive by the end of it. And of course he has to be, because th all of these films so far have been uh, the build-up to the big event film that, that Marvel wanted to do, which is, of course, The Avengers. <coughs> and... This is another film that, uh, I would say should belong. Oh, hey, Tyro Tyrone X Gamer, thanks for the follow. I'm not sure why my, uh, my follow alert didn't go off. Either that or I didn't hear it. But thanks for the follow. Uh, so anyway, like I was saying, uh, The Avengers was Marvel's, uh, big event movie that they were building up to with all these Phase 1 films. And... I also think it belongs in the discussion of uh, superhero movies that are good enough to be enjoyed by anybody, but I can understand why it's uh, not exactly in the discussion 
or for that type of movie because it's kind of lighthearted, kind of upbeat. Oh, thanks for the host. And, uh, aside from, you know, how upbeat and quippy and, and funny it is, uh, it's, it's also not very grounded or, or feature, features, uh, relatable characters. I mean, you got the billionaire inventor, uh, Tony Stark, who, who built a suit of iron and all this high-tech technology. Yeah, th thanks for the host. <coughs> you got a, a, a man who, who was given a super serum soldier who, uh, who, who uses uh, indestructible shield as his weapon. You've got the God of Thunder, Thor himself. You know, and, and his brother Loki as the villain, you know, so... Oh yeah, and uh, Black Widow and Hawkeye are there as well. You know, so... <laughs> you know, who, who in that group of characters is, is really relatable to the average person? You know what I'm saying? It's it's not really relatable, just a really fun and an enjoyable film, but I honestly think that because it's so fun and enjoyable that it's good enough to be uh, in the discussion for superhero movies that anyone can enjoy. And certainly you gotta appreciate how stylistic the movie is. Like, like that, that one shot during the Battle of New York where it's just one continuous shot of like Iron Man flying through the city and then he lands on the ground and helps Captain America and then you're, you're back in the sky and, and seeing what's going on with Black Widow and Hawkeye and you know, this is all one shot, you know, put together, that there's no cuts, it, you, you see it all at once, you know. Things like that are not really seen too often in Marvel films, and, you know, I really gotta give credit to Josh Whedon for the way he wrote and directed this movie. It's really, to this day, still one of the best uh, of the of what the MCU has to offer. Like, I still go back to it and, and watch this film every once in a while, even though many more characters have been introduced since this film. So I would definitely recommend, you know... It doesn't matter if you, you, you don't like superhero movies or not, just give this movie a try. You never know if, whether or not if you might like it or not, you know. <laughs> Certainly, it's more of a fun film than it is a, a, a deep uh, or emotional film or whatever, but if, you, if you're just looking for, for pure entertainment, then you can't go wrong with the Avengers. Certainly not. And those are the, the, the Phase 1 films. Um, phase 2 is uh, kind of a mixed bag, especially here at the beginning. Um, Iron Man 3... Excuse me. Okay, so I, I, I know that a lot of people really don't like Iron Man 3. Uh, and honestly, I think the movie is a lot better than it's given credit for. Um, I'm pretty sure the thing that people dislike about the movie the most is the... Oh, I already have all of... Well, I was just wasting my time then, wasn't I? I think the thing about Iron Man 3 that people dislike the most is the Mandarin twist, and I think they let that ruin the entire film for them. There's a lot more going on in the movie than, than, than just that. You got Tony Stark, you know, having to deal with, uh, learning be how to become, learning how to be Iron Man without an Iron Man suit, and I think that's probably the most interesting thing about the film. And of course, you also have the uh, the villain who has a, a past connection with Tony, and that makes him a lot more personal. Well, actually, I would say it's it's kind of on the same level as Obadiah Stane, but not really. Like, like certainly, he doesn't have a, a long-lasting past with with Tony Stark. Like, he's not a a years-long friend or anything like that. But. Uh, Still, there, there's kind of a, a personal connection there because, you know, it, it's like one of those things where, you know, be careful with uh, 
who you decide to, to bully in school or, or whatever it is that they say. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Basically, the, the lesson that I like to take away from uh, Aldrich, Killian, and Tony Stark's relationship is uh, be nice to everybody because you never know uh, who's going to end up becoming famous or what have you. You know. Certainly, it's not a bad, bad lesson to take away from the movie, even though that it might not be what's intentionally <laughs> the message of the film, but that's certainly one of the things that I think could be learned from the movie. And like I said, it's really not all that bad of a film. There are positive qualities of it. I can understand why people would, would hate the, the Mandarin twist as much as they is, because he is one of Tony Stark's or Iron Man's uh, best adversaries, but uh, at the same time, there is more to the film than just that, so you have to consider everything about the movie, not just what you don't like about it when, you, when it comes to judging it. Um, that said, I'm not... <sighs> At the same time, I am ha having hard things to describe what exactly I like about the movie. Um, certainly, the Iron Patriot, it's nice to have him in an MCU film, even though he goes back to being War Machine in his very next appearance, which is weird. Uh, I do... Yeah, th there's another thing about this movie, too. It's, for some reason, a Christmas movie. I'm not sure what that's about, but apparently the director of this movie, Shane Black, you know, he often, either his movies are set during Christmas time or Christmas is featured in the movie in some way, so, I don't know, <laughs> at, at the very least it makes this a, a nice MCU film to, to play during Christmas time, you know, added to the list of Christmas films that the family watches every year. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I can't really think of, it's hard for me to put into words off the top of my head what I like about the movie, but certainly it's far from one of the worst of the MCU's offering, so, if, should I ever get around to actually doing those MCU reviews that I want to do, I, I will talk in detail about what is good about the movie, because there are good things to say about the film. I just... It's hard for me to, to do it off the top of my head at this very moment. Um, that is... But having said that, I, I can think of more good things to say about this movie than Thor The Dark World, which came out right after this, and uh... Honestly, while I wouldn't consider it the worst MCU film, it is the one that I would rewatch the, the least. Like, so far I've only seen it one time, and I'm in no rush to really ever see it again, even though, like I said, Iron Man 2 was the worst MCU film, but I at least consider it more rewatchable because I do enjoy the dialogue so much. With Thor The Dark World, the only thing I really like about the movie is Loki, and he's not in the movie much, uh, aside from at the very end when they, when Thor has to break him out of his prison and they have to team up in, in order to defeat the villain. And uh, yeah, now that I mentioned the villain, <laughs> the villain of this movie is the, the worst MCU villain out of all of the villains. Aside from not having much screen time, he's also... He's just very boring. Like, he doesn't have much personality to speak of. He doesn't really speak English for much of his dialogue, and... When he does, it's very few lines of dialogue. Like, he's just not a very interesting... He's not a fun villain, he's not interesting. There's just nothing to say about him. He's just so flat and bland and boring. Like, easily the most forgettable MCU villain, and, you know... Again, this is another movie where the story had potential to be good, but it would have needed to be... Excuse me. 
I would say in this case, completely different from what it is in order for it to be good. Like, you got Jane bringing... Jane comes to Asgard because she's infected with the ether and they, they need to get it out of her or, or, you know, contain it however they can. Don't let it fall into the wrong hands and stuff like that. And uh, I honestly think this would have been a good opportunity to explore the world of Asgard more since you spend a lot more time there in this movie than in the first Thor movie. But it's... Okay. Nice. It's not really explored all that much and the focus is a lot more on the villain Malekith and the Aether itself, like like the dangers it possesses and what they should do with Jane in order to keep it from Malekith. And again, you know, the Earth characters, I, <laughs> I don't really dislike them by any means, but they're just nowhere near as good or interesting as the, the Asgardians, and Eric Selvig, I actually did kind of like in the first movie and in, in the Avengers as well, even though he was mind-controlled for most of it. Uh, but uh, for this movie, I, I don't know what they were going with this. For some reason, they decided to make him a comic relief character. It's, it is kind of embarrassing what they did to him, and... Uh, I don't, I don't remember if it's actually explained in the movie that, you know, he went crazy from the mind control that he went through in the first Avengers film, or whatnot, or if that's just a theory, but, you know, whatever the explanation may be, it, it's still not, I don't like what they did with this character in this movie. He, he's certainly less enjoyable in this film than he was in, in the first two films, he was in. Um, but other than that, there, I, there's really not much else to say about the movie other than wasted potential. You know what I mean? I, I wouldn't consider it the worst MCU film, but I can understand why other people would, and I also uh, would consider it at the bottom of the list when it comes to MCU films. <laughs> But, thankfully, this is the, the last time that the MCU would, would ever reach a low point, at least so far. <coughs> because the next film, Captain America the Winter Soldier, is amazing. So, the, the first movie, the first Captain America, was, was a period piece set during World War II. So, it, to me, that, that that's more of a World War II movie than an MCU film, even though you've got a villain... You're dealing with a villain who's using alien technology, but now Captain America is in modern day, and the world's changed, and he has to... Well, it's not so much that he has to uh, learn to adapt to the new world, because he's already got some experience with it, you know, with the first Avengers movie, and... Really, uh... The... <laughs> The central themes are about the movie, I think, are about uh, surveillance and secrecy and how trustworthy the government is and stuff like that. And uh, I think that the themes, films, the, the film's themes are strong and. They're, they're part of what make the movie enjoyable, but also, um... The action scenes are very exciting to watch in the movie. Like, like even though the, nobody has any real superpowers in this film, uh, they still manage to make the action scenes very exhilarating, thrilling, and enjoyable to watch. So, just on, on those grounds alone, I would rank this as one of the best MCU films, if not for... Uh, the story and characters alongside with it. Um, yeah, it, the, the final uh, action sequence in particular is uh, this. This the movie ends on a very high note, and I actually really like uh, what Black Widow says to uh, the government at the end of the film as well. It, it's 
a really great ending, and a really great thing, a really great... <laughs> uh, I'm struggling to speak here. Uh, basically, look, just Captain America the Winter Soldier is awesome. You should go see it. Not, not entirely sure if I should say any, just anybody would enjoy the movie, but certainly if you like action movies in general, rather than just superhero films, definitely, definitely go see it. And, uh, now, <laughs> get ready for a double whammy, because the next movie, Guardians of the Galaxy, is also amazing. And this is a movie that a lot of people thought would fail, but, like, even I had my doubts. Like, I thought, <laughs> really, Guardians of the Galaxy? This is the next movie you're, you're gonna make? Like, why would you make this movie? It doesn't make any sense. <coughs> no, nobody thought this movie was going to be good. And then I watched it, and... <sighs> wow. It ended up being so good that I actually thought it was either just as good, if not slightly not as good, as the first Avengers movie. <laughs> like, it was seriously that damn good. Like... I really like not just the character development of all the characters, but also, you know, how they meet, how they bond, how they interact with each other. And uh, this is also the first movie that actually explains what the Infinity Stones are, and these are going to be very important in the MCU going forward, because they're the whole thing that that start. Like, okay, so the first Avengers movie introduced you know, the Tesseract. Well, okay, it wasn't that movie that introduced it. It was the, the post credit scene for Thor that introduced it. And then it was brought back for Captain America, the first Avenger. And then the Tesseract was the focus of... The plot was centered around it in the first Avengers movie. Well, it turns out that it is actually an Infinity Stone. And these stones are what the, uh, the real big overarching villain of the entire MCU, or rather, the Infinity Saga of the MCU, Thanos. He's after the Infinity Stones, and eventually he's going to attempt to collect them all, and Guardians of the Galaxy is the first movie that truly explains what the Infinity Stones are, and that was a, a big moment for me, because, uh, I love the Infinity Gauntlet story in the comics, and I really wanted to see the story play out in the MCU. Like, how is it going to play out and stuff like that. Especially, you know, seeing Thanos in the movie, that, that, that's, that's a huge thing for me. So, the fact that uh, this movie, it's, it was the first movie that not only explained the Infinity Stones, but also showed what all of them were. And, you know, granted, they're different colors than they are in the comics, and they're gems, not stones, in the comics. That doesn't really matter. What, what really matters is what they do, and, and the fact that Thanos is after them, and bad things are gonna happen if he gets his hands on them. And, you know, when the heroes are, are told what the Infinity Stones are, and when they see what they can do, they, they realize just how bad for well, everybody that they are, and thus that's motivation for them to keep them away from the villain, and, uh... You know, the villain of this movie is, of course, an another weak villain, but I think he's... Okay, I wouldn't say he's better than what people give him credit for, but at the same time... Did I get it? Okay. Oh, wait. No, that was Cloud. Okay, yeah, I did get it. <laughs> He's not better than what people give him credit for, but certainly he did have the potential to be better. I know I've been saying that a lot, but it's true. He did have the potential to be better than he was. But, you know, basically what it comes down to is... His motivations are very quickly explained when he's introduced. And that's it. He, it's never really explored or, or looked upon deeper than that. And that's 
why he ultimately suffers as a villain because he's not very deep. He's not. He doesn't have sympathetic or relatable motivations. You know, that's pretty much what it comes down to for a lot of these villains. Uh, I wouldn't call him boring necessarily. Certainly, he's got more of a personality. <coughs> more of a personality than Malekith, that's for sure. But certainly, he, when it comes to MCU villains, he's definitely one of the weaker ones because he didn't... Because, again, his motivations are not thoroughly explored or, or looked at. So yeah, he, he's certainly one of the weaker ones, but I wouldn't say completely terrible because, again, the potential was there. Yeah, um, Guardians of the Galaxy is a great film. Go watch it. It's fun, entertaining, pretty much, you know. I would say it has almost everything you could want from the movie. Uh, okay, maybe not. I mean, it does have a talking tree and raccoon <laughs> as <laughs> characters in the film. So, certainly it doesn't have relatable characters, and it is a sci-fi movie set in outer space, so... That's certainly something that would put people off, uh, certain people off, but, uh... You know, if you enjoy sci-fi films, then certainly Guardians of the Galaxy is more than a good enough film to be watched. Um, uh, let me see. I think Age of Ultron was the one that came out after Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Age of Ultron, yeah. I think, yeah. So, Age of Ultron, like Iron Man 3, I think people hate this movie way more than they should. I don't think it deserves to be hated at all, to be honest. Um, you know, things like the quips and, and Ultron being a boring villain are, are things that people mention when, when bringing up why this film is bad. I honestly don't, don't see what, what what's wrong with the quips, you, you know, like, would you rather have the dialogue be completely sterile and, and, and boring and uninteresting and not fun, you know, like, like what's the alternative to, to quippy dialogue, like, like they don't even quip that much. It's really only during the action scenes that they have the one-liners, so... <clears throat> I think it's much less of a problem than, than people make it out to be. But, you know, people like to complain, so... Of course, they'll, they'll nitpick anything they can. There's really a lot more to the movie than just the negative stuff people mention about it. Um, I... I honestly think that the quippiness of the dialogue is part of what makes it uh, is part of what makes the movie fun and enjoyable to watch. You know, like again, uh, I did forget to mention that the first Avengers movie was another movie that uh, lacked action. Like, <laughs> admittedly, it did did not have very much action in it. Although what it did, it was very good, and. Uh, I'm not sure if I would say the story is what made that movie great so much as the dialogue and character interactions. And I would say that the same also applies to Age of Ultra. <laughs> Excuse me. Again, this movie was written and directed by Josh Whedon, and I don't care what anybody says, that man knows his stuff. Okay, so... Pretty much, he knows what he's doing when he's directing these kinds of films, and... Age of Ultron, while not as good as the first Avengers movie, is still a very fun and enjoyable film to watch. The dialogue and character interaction are part of the reason why. And the film also introduces Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch, which, you know, the more characters the better, right? Um, certainly... <clears throat> Like, like, some people say that the movie isn't as dark as advertised, but honestly, when you consider things like, like, uh, you know, the fact that Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, you know, they had to survive with a bomb right next to them, or, or whatever it is that they said, 
they, uh, you know, stuff like that is dark, you know what I mean? As well as the fact that, you know, we see uh, Black Widow's, uh, basically a glimpse of Black Widow's origin story of how she became assassin and such, you know, and, and she and Bruce, you know, they have a relationship develop, it kind of comes out of nowhere, it doesn't really make any sense. The fact that we haven't seen the Hulk in a movie before this certainly means that there's a lack of character development that would be necessary to make the relationship believable, but uh, that aside, they do have a conversation with each other about each other and how they're both monsters or whatever, and, you know, talk about that kind of stuff is, you know, it, it overall is a darker film than in, in the first Avengers movie, even if it's not overt. You know, and uh, um, you know, I would say that Ultron is also a better villain than he's given credit for. Uh, certainly, I would say he's like mid tier in terms of the MCU villains. Not one of the worst, but not one of the best either. He he's a good villain in ways that are not obvious to the casual viewer. Like you gotta basically read interviews that Josh Whedon conducted about the film and specifically about Ultron in order to really understand his character and why he does certain things that he does in the movie. But once you find out these things, I think he becomes a much better villain than what he appears to be on the surface and that's why I believe he's a, a much better villain than people give him credit for, even though, even though he doesn't appear to be. Um, but yeah, Age of Ultron is still a good, enjoyable film to watch, even though it's not as good as the first Avengers movie. It gets way more hate than it deserves, and yeah, you should go... You should see it anyway, even if it's not as good as the first Avengers movie. It's really a shame that, you know, Josh Whedon had that falling out with, with Marvel after this movie, and how the, the movie basically broke him, as he says, because I really would have liked to see what he would have done with Infinity War and Endgame. I'm sure it would have been amazing. And with that, we have the last uh, MCU film, which is Ant-Man. And, uh, you know, this is another one of those movies that certainly a good film, but not one of the best. Like, it's not mind-blowingly great or anything like that, but still good enough to be worth a watch at least, you know what I mean? Like, it's another story of redemption, I would say, even though Scott Lang ends up going back to thievery, even though he said he would quit that life, but at the same time, you know, it's hard for a, a convicted felon to, to get honest work after, you know, being released from prison, and uh, even though the movie never really goes deep with it, the, the fact that they make that part of his character at all does mean that it is somewhat addressed, at least, like, it's the, the smallest bit of social commentary that, that you could expect from one of these movies, but it's there, and I appreciate it nonetheless, you know what I mean? Like. The entire movie doesn't have to be about it in order for it to, uh, in order for the movie to make its point about it. Like, what you see in the film about it is pretty much all you need to see in order to get an <clears throat> idea of what it. I'm not. I'm not explaining this very well. But ho hopefully, hopefully, it's what I'm trying to say is understood anyway. Uh, Certainly, Ant-Man's abilities, what he can do, and stuff like that, make for has a lot of potential for some great imagery and uh, action scenes. Like, like he has the ability to, to shrink down in size, and while that might not seem like an amazing ability at first, as the movie demonstrates, there's actually a lot of applications for that kind of superpower, and, uh... 
he, his, his strength is also enhanced when he's shrunken down, so it's not like he, he becomes weaker or anything like that. Like, he, he, he pretty much gains, like, strength proportional to an ant, so, like, he can lift something heavier than himself or, or bigger than himself or whatever it is, you know, despite his small size. So he is effectively a, a, a super ant as a human, and he can control other ants as well. And, you know, like I said, there's a lot of potential for fun and creative imagery with a power like that. And while, again, this isn't one of the best MCU films, it certainly does a whole lot good with what it's given, and it does make the movie enjoyable to watch, even though, again, it's not one of the best. It's just... I'll say this much. It's better than just okay, and it's better than... You know, I, I would say... Ant-Man is good enough. But that's probably the best way to put it. Good enough, if not better than good enough, just... It doesn't go over the top in greatness. Now, Phase 3 is where these films become crazy. Like, with the exception of two movies, I think every movie in Phase 3 is, in one way or another, amazing. Like, first we have, uh... Okay, good. <clears throat> we have Captain America Civil War, which a lot of people refer to as Avengers 2.0. And it's easy to see why, why people call it that, because it's one of those movies that features almost everybody. Like, it's basically a team-up film, except it's not called The Avengers. But despite that, I, I really do think Captain America is uh, an important central figure in the film, and the story does revolve around, uh... The story does revolve around uh, him and Bucky, so... Oh wait, I gave him... he was holding the dragon. So even though it, it's like a team-up film with how many characters are in the movie, um, <clears throat> I would still say it's Captain America's film through and through. There's a lot of focus on, on him and Bucky in the film, and they're really uh, what's at the center of the film, Bucky in particular, and uh, just gotta make sure. Right, I, I forgot to put material on. <clears throat> so, uh, just like I was saying, um... Yeah, Bucky is at the center of the plot in this movie, and, uh... It's another uh, film with, with themes surrounding government, uh, this time uh, rather not if superheroes should be regulated by the government, and uh, <coughs> what effect that, that would have on the world and such, and you know, I do kind of wish that they would do more with it, but at the same time I feel like they do enough that it's kind of unnecessary. Uh, that being said, uh, once again, it's the action sequences that are part of the reason. Oh shit. Okay, good. I almost started doing this without the proper setup. Um, you know, the action sequences and the story are, are what make the film great, and uh, it, it, this movie in particular, I think, has 
an excellent balance between story and action. Because you're never spending too much time, you know, doing one or the other. You know, it's not unbalanced. Excuse me, it's not a film where the action is the focus more than the story and thus. Excuse me, it's very shallow, but at the same time, the focus is not on the story so much that there's a lack of action. It has, I wouldn't say 50-50, but a nice enough balance that you're not engaged in too much of either. But uh, having said that, I do think that uh, the first time I watched the movie, I did think that the airport fight went on a little longer than it should have. But then, I, you know, upon re-watching the film, and I have re-watched it multiple times since my first viewing, I guess it's fine. Like, I thought it went on for too long my first viewing, but I, I didn't exactly grow tired of it upon multiple viewings. So I suppose the length of it is fine. Um, this movie does introduce two major characters, Black Panther and Spider-Man, who has been absent for the MCU for the longest time because Sony owns the movie rights to Spider-Man, and they... After the performance of Amazing Spider-Man 2, they finally made a deal that allowed Marvel to use Spider-Man in the MCU, which is a good thing, because they, the MCU needed Spider-Man for the longest time, and I really like the way he's introduced. Certainly, they could have introduced him more naturally, and Nando vs. Movies made a video talking about that, although... The, the way that he suggests that Spider-Man could have been more naturally introduced, it would have required them to already have the movie rights to Spider-Man, like, well before uh, development of the film started. Like, from what I can tell, they made the deal very close to the end of pre-production or, or the writing process or, or something like that. So there wasn't a, a whole lot of time for them to do things like like they pretty much only had time to, to cast who would be playing Spider-Man and, and you know write how he would be introduced to the story like what Nando versus movies suggests you know they would have needed to have uh, casted you know students at, at, at Peter Parker's uh, school you know who is his best friend who who would be playing his best friend and. They would have to change the shooting locations, you know, for, for where the fights take place and stuff like that, so... They, they would have needed to have already had the rights to Spider-Man, you know, instead of getting them at the last minute in order for them to do his ideas. But having said that, given how they did introduce Spider-Man in Civil War, I, I think they did it naturally enough that it's good enough to be happy with. Like, I personally have no complaints with how it's done. They, they did the best they could given the time frame and how suddenly they, they got the rights to Spider-Man during the development of Civil War, you know? And then Black Panther is introduced and uh, this strangely acts both as his origin story as like, it's kind of, <laughs> okay, so one thing I do like about Civil War is the fact that it's easy to say that it's kind of all over the place with who the focus is on. Like, again, I would say this is ultimately a Captain America film, despite all of the other characters featured in it. But it is, you know, partially about the Avengers as well. And it's also partially about Black Panther, because this is the movie where he's introduced. It's his origin story and his character development as well. So, you know, it, it's kind of all of these things at once, but at the same time, the movie doesn't feel unfocused, like, they didn't know where to go with the story or what kind of story that they wanted to tell, you know. Like, they knew what they wanted to do, and they managed to execute it as best as they could with what they were given. So, I actually think that that's pretty amazing that they managed to 
have the focus be on all of these different characters and, and yet still not have the movie or its plot lose its focus. You know what I mean? Like, it, it sticks to the story it wants to tell. Nice. You know, it knows what it wants to do. It doesn't feel confused at all. Like, like you're not sure of what exactly the point of this or that is supposed to be. It, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a pretty solid and focused film. And again, just... It's another one of those movies that it's got pretty much everything you could you could ask for from a movie like this. Like, if you enjoy superhero movies, if you enjoy action movies, Captain America Civil War is a film to watch. You, you will enjoy it no matter what. Um, you know, provided you, you have seen, you know, the rest of the films. Like, one thing I, I will say about the MCU is that it could be difficult for a casual viewer to get into because there are a lot of seemingly unrelated films that are necessary to watch in order to understand the overarching plot. Like, you can't just watch Captain America the First Avenger and Captain America Winter Soldier and understand the plot of Civil War. You also need to see the other two Avengers movies and, you know, I guess by extension you also need to see the Thor movies because they, those are also connected to the Avengers films. <coughs> you know, so it's not just the, the movies that the main protagonist is about that you need to watch. There, there's other films you need to see as well in order to fully understand everything that's going on in these movies. And, uh, I suppose at the end of the of, of this, I, I will say what movies I think are the most important to watch. Um, but, uh, for the time being, I'll, I'll just go over what, 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 what I uh, think about each film individually, and then I'll, I'll focus on what movies I think are necessary to watch to understand the plot and why I think that. So the next film is Doctor Strange, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the impression that I get from what other people think about this movie is that it's not very good, it's very slow or boring or whatever. You know, like, like it's not one of the best that MCU has to offer, and I have to strongly disagree with that opinion. Like, I don't, I don't see what people are missing about this movie because this is easily one of the best MCU films. Like, there's certainly an argument to be made that they cared more about the special effects than the story, but that's another idea that I disagree with. Um, this is another movie where. To me, what makes the movie is the character development, you know? Um, Doctor Strange is... Like, a lot of people make comparisons to him and Tony Stark. And there are some similarities between uh, them and how their characters develop, certainly. <clears throat> like, they're both... Oh, shit. Fuck, I've been wasting time again. <sighs> Alright, well... Um, so like I was saying, uh... <laughs> the similarities between how Tony Stark develops his character and how Doctor Strange develops his character are, are certainly... Like, they're certainly comparable. Like, they're both rich guys. They, they both, you know, fell victim to... Like, they're basically... It's basically their own fault that they, uh, go through what they go through. Like, they're... they're they, they cause their own suffering, is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Um, and, uh... Hold on. I, I'm actually gonna, gonna pause my, uh... MCU thoughts for a second here because I actually need to think about what, what I'm gonna do next. Because if I remember correctly, the the best way to farm uh, limit break uses is to 
it's not over here. This is Goblin Island. It's Cactar Island that I need to go to in order to farm Limit Break uses. It's not here. Is this it? No, this isn't it. Is this it? No, it's not this either. I think this might be it. get back to talking about the MCU in just a second. Good to go. So this isn't Cactar Island. Hold on a
Ugh. I gotta remember not to do that. Of course, it's an unmarked island. Yeah, that's a good idea. <clears throat> okay, so, uh... So like I was saying, uh... Shit, I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, Doctor Strange. I think Doctor Strange's character development is really what makes the movie. I mean, obviously the special effects are amazing. Like, even after Infinity War, I think, uh... This has the, the best special effects of any Marvel movie to date. Uh... Waste no time showing off the special effects. Oh. What the hell? There must be something I'm doing wrong. Hmm. is, uh... You know, actually using the, the limit break and not so much uh, killing with it. And that is what I... Where's her store? Shit, did I put it on cloud? I keep losing my train of thought. Doctor Strange, yeah. It's a good movie. Uh, uh, some people say, you know, it, it's more about the, the, the action than the story. Uh, I disagree. I think the story is great. You know, Doctor Strange's character development is great. Um, you know, th there's a lot of similarities between him and Tony Stark, uh, but uh, enough differences that they're not exactly the same. Um, um, I'm trying to talk quickly and it's not working out. Um, what was I going to say? Um, look, look. <laughs> look, all I'll say is that, you know, Doctor Strange is a great movie, go watch it. Doctor Strange's character development is great, the special effects are great, the best special effects of any Marvel movie ever, even after Infinity War. Um, yeah, uh, that, yeah, screw it, let's just, let's just leave it at that. Um, what came next? 
I believe it was Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 that came out after Doctor Strange, and, uh... So yeah, um, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, um, I wouldn't say it's more of the same in that it's like you could watch the first one and the second one is, is no different. They're certainly, um, I would say the film is either as good as Guardians of the Galaxy 1 or slightly not. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong, that, that's... Well, I got Barrett's next limit, at least. this up real quick, but I'll try to talk about uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 while I look this up. So, uh, you know, it's it's about as good as the first movie. I, I would say it's either as good or slightly less as good. Uh, really, the biggest problem with the movie for me is that um, the way the humor in Guardians 1 was written felt more natural. Like, like certain things would happen or characters would say certain things and how it was funny was sort of incidental like it wasn't really written to be funny it just happened to be whereas with Guardians 2 the humor is very much a lot more deliberate like like the, the like the funny moments were clearly written to be funny moments you know like it, it's a lot more obvious that that humor is what they were going for but at the same time, it does some things better than the first movie. Like, for example, the villain is much better. Oh, speaking of which, the, the villain. <laughs> I, I've forgotten to talk about the, the villain. And, and... Alright, so, go so going back to Civil War. Um, real quick, I just want to mention the, the villain. He, he doesn't really have much presence in the movie itself, because, again, it's Civil War. That It's the heroes that are the threat to themselves more than the villain is. But, the fact that he is relatable and has sympathetic motivations excuse me, makes him a much better villain than what came before. <coughs> and I wouldn't say the same thing about Kaecilius and Doctor Strange, although I wouldn't really consider him to be <coughs> excuse me, the actual uh, villain of the movie. It's really more Dormammu than anything. But he doesn't show up until the very end, so... I can understand why a lot of people wouldn't consider him to be the villain of the movie. Uh, but it's certainly understandable why Cassilius is not very interesting as a villain, because he's more of a henchman of the actual real villain. Um, and that's pretty much what he is in the comics, too. Like, like he, he was never... Uh, he was actually... Uh, a henchman of, of Mordo rather than Dormammu, but uh, but Mordo is a good guy in, in Doctor Strange movie. So um, certainly, I would have preferred they they picked an actor who actually looked like uh, Baron Mordo to to play him in the Doctor Strange film. But given how what his character is like in the movie, and and how his character ultimately develops by the end of the film. Um, I'm okay with, with, you know, how he is in, in, in the Doctor Strange film. So, uh, hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this real quick. understand now. So I think I understand. Alright, now I know what I have to do. Okay, 
time material. To stop him. That will... To Guardians 2. Uh, the villain is one of the things about the movie that it does better than the first film because of uh, um, I wouldn't really call him a relatable villain exactly. More so, you can understand. <laughs> like certainly, okay, he's not necessarily a sympathetic villain, but you, at the same time, you could still understand his motivation. Like, I, I doubt there's many people... Like, nobody in the world is... <laughs> oh. Oh. I, I did this wrong. Okay. It's not stop, it's manipulate. Losing focus here. mind on the topic at hand here. As I was saying, the villain of Guardians 3 has an understandable motivation rather than uh, necessarily a sympathetic one. But that said, I think that that's enough to, to, to work at uh, But that said, I think that that's enough to make him a good enough villain that like, he doesn't need to be relatable or sympathetic, just understood. Shit, I don't like doing There's some, also some character development in Guardians 2 that, that happens that, uh, you know, oh, okay. Satellite beam. Yeah, like I was saying, uh, aside from the humor seeming forced, uh... What the hell? Why did he do that? Okay, there's obviously something that I've set up. to uh, great character development, great, um, uh, the humor is forced but f still funny, um, great sci-fi movie, go see it if you enjoyed the first one, um, it has a great villain, very, uh, very personal to, to the protagonist, um, Great character development. You know, and, 
an overall great move. I'm not very focused right now, so I, I apologize for for all of these. Uh, I, yeah, my my mind is a mess right now. I apologize. Well, what's the next? I think Thor Ragnarok is the next movie. Yeah, Thor Ragnarok. Um, this is definitely the the the, 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 the point where the. No, Thor Ragnarok is not next. Um, the next... Why do I even... Oh yeah, I used I use Big Guard for the, uh, the... I use Big Guard for the haste. movie is not Thor Ragnarok, it's Spider-Man Homecoming, which at the time of its release I thought was the best Spider-Man movie ever, but then, you know, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse came out and completely demolished that film. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about Into the Spider-Verse another time. This is about the MCU, so let's talk about Spider-Man Homecoming. Um, the reason why I like this film so much is because, uh, it's a version of Spider-Man. What? <laughs> wow. It's a version of Spider-Man that's certainly uh, different, but also familiar at the same time. Like, it's probably the most comic-accurate Spider-Man version, while at the same time being very different from the comics and other movies. Other incarnations of Spider-Man in general, really. Um, Like, you know, pretty much, like, you know, no Norman or Harry Osborn, no Mary Jane, no... No Daily Bugle or J. Jonah Jameson. You know, like, there's a lot of things missing that you would expect to be in a Spider-Man movie, you know, like, like... No Uncle Ben, that's definitely a huge point of contention for people who don't like this version of Spider-Man, but... Honestly, you know... Considering we already had two, like it would not have been a smart move for them to do another, you know, origin story movie for Spider-Man. Considering, especially since we had just gotten Amazing Spider-Man, the Amazing Spider-Man uh, film series before this, so to have another origin story so soon after the last one. I think people would have gotten tired of seeing that, so it, it's, it was a really smart move for them to make it as different as it is, even though there are obviously some people who are not happy with that. Um, and the fact that, you know, this is one of the things that makes him uh, more accurate to the comics, is the fact that he starts off as a kid in high school, rather than as an adult college student, you know? That that's one of the things that, that the, the first two movies, uh, movie series, uh, skipped over, you know. They skipped high school straight into college, and here he, he's a high school student instead, and even though Spider-Man is a pretty relatable character already, I think the fact that he's just a kid in high school makes him even more relatable. <clears throat> Certainly, uh... There's a lot of people who are... Come on. There's a lot of people who are part of the target audience for the, the, the film that would, uh... Be able to relate to this version of Peter Parker more than the... the than, than, than Toby and Andrew, a Andrew Garfield. Um, certainly the movie is a, a lot more light-hearted than the other Spider-Man films, and, uh... I'm just gonna use the Turbo Ether. I 
think the fact that Spider-Man Homecoming being more light-hearted in nature, it works in its favor more than against it. And there's some interesting uh, character, like, yeah, some, some people don't like the, the, the fact that there's Iron Man tech as part of the Spider-Man suit now. Excuse me. I honestly think it's fine, especially since he, he ends up having to learn how to be Spider-Man without it. Which is, of course, a, a callback to Iron Man 3, and one that, that's really good, considering how almost no other films... In fact, I think this is the only... No, th there is one other movie that, that calls back to Iron Man 3 besides this one, but... The one in this movie is, is very good, and it does teach a, a very important lesson. At least for, you know, Peter. And I'm pretty sure... You know what? Just to be on the safe side, I'm gonna save here. I'm pretty sure after he learns all of his other limits, I just need to use the item and he can... Yes! <sighs> okay. So we're done with that. I forgot to... Now you know what, it's fine. Alright, thanks, Barrett. I'm sorry I, I suck so much at uh, giving my thoughts on the fly. I'm not as smart as most peop other people are, so I I'm not <laughs> as good as speaking from the top of my head as other people, but I am at least making an effort. I'm trying, okay? Just bear with me, okay? should have equipped Luck Plus when I was farming for kills earlier. I was saying that the characters in Spider-Man Homecoming are different. The movie is more lighthearted than the other Spider-Man movies, but that doesn't mean that there aren't any stakes in the film. And it doesn't make the movie any less enjoyable to watch. I think it works in the movie's favor. Uh, certainly this version of Spider-Man is more relatable. Um, his character development is different from other films. But, but still, uh... But still... Oh, fuck. Yeah, that, that was a mistake. I, I should not have... Uh, I should not have put counter-attack on her.
yes! Now, if only if I could have done that during a boss fight or something. <laughs> I think that last one is the only thing I need to worry about actually doing. You know, I'm just repeating myself about Spider-Man Homecoming uh, at this point, so, I'm, you know, just consider everything that I already said about it, and it's it's worth watching, go see it, especially if you're a Spider-Man fan, it's a good movie, okay? Now, oh, I, I forgot to take Counter-Attack off the Tifa. Okay, focus, focus. saying oh yeah I, I didn't even start talking about for Ragnarok yet um, this is the point where a lot of people would, would say well actually I, I guess you could say it started with Guardians 2 but you know a lot of people started thinking you know Marvel just makes comedy films now you know and Thor Ragnarok certainly reinforced the idea because the movie pretty much is just an outright comedy You know, despite being named Ragnarok, <laughs> you know what I mean? And being based off of the Ragnarok story, it's actually a hybrid of the Thor Ragnarok story and uh, the uh, 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 Planet Hulk, because, you know, Universal owns the movie rights to Hulk, so they can't... Uh... Okay, Marvel can use the Hulk in movies, but not as the main character, and... You know, the only other films he's been in besides The Incredible Hulk is The Avengers, so they wanted to use the Hulk in a movie again for a second. And of course, the, the one that I needed to get I missed. <coughs> So yeah, Thor Ragnarok is a is a Ragnarok hybrid. Uh, Ragnarok Planet Hulk hybrid, <laughs> and uh, while it's certainly easy to to see why some would feel that it's more Planet Hulk than Ragnarok, I think it's pretty evenly balanced, even if. Uh, the way that the two stories are shared seem unbalanced, like, um, certainly it does seem like there's more time spent on, uh, what's the name of the planet called? Shit, I forgot. Um, but you know what I'm talking about if you've seen the movie. It's, it's the, the jump planet that... Excuse me. Thor ends up on after the villain Hela first shows up. Excuse me. You know, Thor needs to get back to Asgard so he can stop Ragnarok from happening. You know, lots of funny things happen along the way, and there's lots of great, you know, great dialogue and character interactions are pretty much a common thing in these movies. So you know, it's it's pretty much something to be expected at this point. You know, like, you want, especially with Phase 3, you know, you watch a Marvel movie, you can expect funny and, in general, great character interactions and dialogue, you know. This movie in particular. Wow, I... Alrighty then. I obviously used Tifa a lot, so that didn't take very long at all. Safety save.
I need. <sighs> I'm losing my train of thought big time. Um, So yeah, Thor Ragnarok, you know, oh yeah, Th Thor's character development, another thing that, that, that that's common in, in Marvel movies, great character development, um, you know, Thor is actually a character that's had a lot of, uh, of character development over the course of all of these movies. But what happens to him in, in, in this movie in particular is certainly the most damaging to him, and uh, certainly it would only get worse from him, you know, in, 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 in later films, uh, as I will soon discuss. Uh, but yeah, uh, he, he's been through a lot, and, and this is, even though this is a lighthearted, funny comedy film, you know, he, what he goes through in this movie in particular, uh, really... Oh. Oh. I mean, fuck, I might as well do this anyway. And then, get a limit break use for... Um, some people can, you know, compare Thor Ragnarok to Guardians of the Galaxy. I think it's an unfair comparison because the style of humor is different, the character interactions are different, you know, the aesthetic is different. But, uh, it's still a great film nonetheless, and I definitely... Oh wait, I shouldn't be building up. But yeah, Thor Ragnarok is a is a great movie regardless of, of like the, some people might say that it's too heavy on the humor. Um, I mean, I could understand that given you know that it is that the story is partially Ragnarok and. Uh, Certainly, humor isn't everyone's tastes, and humor is also highly subjective, but... Nonetheless, I, I still think it's a great movie, and I would recommend seeing it, and... Um, yeah, I mean, I said in, when I was talking about uh, Thor the Dark World that uh, Loki was one of the best things um, about, um, Thor the Dark World, and he's in Ragnarok a whole lot more, so, you know, certainly that's one of the reasons that, that the movie is better than the first two Thor movies, so, yeah. One second, I, I gotta grab a tissue. Nah. 
didn't take very long. I, uh... These aren't tissues exactly, but these will do. Oh yeah, Korg and Meek, that they're introduced in uh, Thor Ragnarok, and uh, Meek doesn't talk, so he doesn't really have much of a character, but, but Korg is uh, a very funny and entertaining character. Um, he is uh, responsible for one, I would say, one or maybe two moments where the, the movie uses humor at an inappropriate moment, but, you know... Otherwise, I, I wouldn't say that the film really suffers from overindulging in humor or anything like that. Like, it strikes a nice balance despite being largely a comedy film. And, uh... <clears throat> but yeah, I... Again, I, I would recommend seeing this movie. It's... It's fun, funny, entertaining, and fun to watch. Ah, screw it. He, he, he's already got the limit, so I might as well use it. next, uh, Black Panther, uh, some people would say this movie is overrated, and, uh, I would say the, the people who say it's overrated underrate the movie, because while I do agree that it's not as great as, oh, I, I didn't use a hyper on <coughs> Red 13. It's not as great at, as the people who love it make it out to be, but it's not a bad film either. It's actually a, a very good film. You know, certainly T'Challa had all of his character development. Well, not all of his character development, but a large chunk of it in Civil War, so... There's not as much for, for, for him to have here in this movie, but he still does have character development. He's, not written like a, a perfect character who doesn't need to grow or anything like that. Yo, Sacred Blood Lord, what's up? Uh, I, I would think you, you'd be watching Caleb's stream right now. I was just uh, talking uh, about Marvel films while I uh, farm Limit Break kills and Limit Break uses since there's nothing else to talk about while doing this absolutely <laughs> riveting nonsense. Back and forth? Yo, that that's nice. Uh, I appreciate you stopping by. Uh, <clears throat> I know I do that sometimes myself, you know. Uh, I have one stream open while I'm watching another. Because there's two people that I want to watch on at the same time. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> I keep losing my, my, my train of thought. What was I talking about? Alright. Uh, Black Panther, um, nice, so that means I can gain Omni Slash now. Alright, I, I don't get the achievement because I already got it before, oh, when I, when I beat the game the first time. Alright, that's right, I wanted to use the Hyper as well. <laughs> okay, so, as I was saying, uh, Black Panther, uh, uh, when I first saw it, uh, I thought, I mean, yes, it's, a, it's another one of these movies that there's more focus on the, the story than the action, but I also think that the story is the movie's strongest point. 
<clears throat> the movie's strong point, so you're not exactly bored while watching it, but, but certainly it's not as fun as the other MCU films because it is a more serious story. Like, the, the, the hero is not happy, upbeat, fun, quippy, you know what I mean? He, certainly he, he takes his job more seriously than the other heroes. Not to say that the other heroes don't take their job seriously, but certainly there's a large difference in style and tone in this movie than the other ones. Like, yeah, there, there's strong emphasis on African culture in the movie. Like, I was actually surprised by just how African the movie was, despite the fact that the director said before the movie came out that there would be a lot of African culture emphasized in the movie. Uh, <laughs> I'm so unfocused right now. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> this is, a, of course, for me trying to form and talk about movies all at the same time and manage inventory and I don't even know. I did use the hyper, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's another thing too. Like, Black Panther is also one of these movies that's not exactly necessary to watch in order to understand the plot of the MCU. It just gives more background on uh, his character and his country in particular. And uh, certainly, you know, fans like me would appreciate that sort of thing, but not everybody in the casual audience would uh, necessarily enjoy that. And that's... Oh, God, he's almost dead. <laughs> But, you know, I am a big fan uh, of the, the Marvel Cinematic yeah, yeah. MCU films, so uh, I do appreciate it more than most people would. Uh, I'm gonna need to... Alright, I, I'm, I'm, I have W item on, so... Uh... Oh wait, I have Angel Whisper, what am I doing? But you know, in spite of the fact that it's a much more story focused film, I would still say Black Panther is worth seeing, provided you're okay with that sort of thing. You know, like, like tastes vary and, and things like that, but if you're okay with a, a superhero film that's not super into the action and more focused on the story, I would say Black Panther is worth watching, even if, you know, most people can't exactly relate to him, if you know what I'm saying. But, but certainly, if, if you are like Black Panther, so to speak, you, you would be able to most likely relate to him, even if you, you're not uh, African-born, but regardless, you know, it's a great film either way, perhaps a little overrated, but not too much. You know, like how overrated Black Panther is, is overblown in my opinion. And with that, we, we have reached the, uh, the big event film that everybody's been waiting for since the, the first Avengers movie, Infinity War. And, uh, this, in my opinion, is the best Marvel movie, if, you know, not just best MCU film movie, but, but best Marvel movie. Well, okay, there, there is some other contenders for best Marvel movie that are not MCU made, but as far as MCU film goes, definitely Infinity War is the best one. For, for one thing, it might not seem this way to everybody, but... It is a villain protagonist movie, you know, like Thanos is <coughs> the protagonist of Infinity War. And, uh, I wouldn't call it his origin story necessarily, but, 
you do get an idea of his background and who he is enough that this is pretty much the film where you learn about him. And, uh... Oh yeah, I didn't even talk about the villain of Black Panther. It, he is another example of a, a great villain in, in, you know, like, like... In the first two phases, the villains weren't so great aside from Loki, but... Black Panther had a villain that was a great example of, a Villain with sympathetic motivations that... You could understand why he's doing what he's doing, and... You know, if it wasn't for the way that he, uh handles things, like, he could honestly be thought of as a hero, rather, and Thanos is actually kind of the same way, like, if it wasn't for the fact that he was trying to, uh, correct the universe by eliminating half of all life, he would most likely be heroic in all likelihood. Rather than, but of course, you know, he wants to gather the Infinity Stone so he can wipe out half of all life in the universe because he feels, you know, like, yes, overpopulation and lack of resources and stuff like that are, are problems, but it's the way he go wants to go about uh, solving that problem that makes him a villain. And. <laughs> This is another movie that, uh, I would say balances out action and story rather finely to a degree that you're not getting way too much of one or the other. And, again, <laughs> I feel like I'm starting to repeat myself too much because the character interactions are great, the dialogue is great, you know. There's a lot of funny moments, but there's also a lot of serious moments, and, you know... Certainly the ending is the most iconic part of the film, and... I, and I mean this in more ways than one, but this is pretty much the, uh... Not The Last Jedi, the, uh... The, this is the Empire Strikes Back of, of MCU films, with the way it ends and everything, you know? Uh... I don't want to say too much for the people who haven't seen the movie yet, but I'm pretty sure, uh... Most people who have wanted to see the movie have seen it already, but you know what happens at the end. Uh, even if you've not seen the movie yet, if you're familiar with the story it's based off of, you, you, you probably know what happens and can understand why the ending is the most iconic part of the movie and why there's so many memes about it, you know? It really does make Thanos a villain unlike any we've had before. I mean, I can't really think of many other villains that have not only accomplished their goal, but on the scale that Thanos does, you know? And even without uh, the Infinity Stones, he's still a threatening villain, as we would see later on. Uh, but in this movie in particular, he, he definitely shines as, you know, his presence, uh, his, uh, you know, he, he feels like a real character. He's not just, uh, an evil douchebag who does bad things because he's evil. He <clears throat> has understandable motivations for what he does. He has a range of emotions that a lot of villains don't have, you know, he, he becomes angry, he becomes saddened, you know, right? I don't want to give away too much, but let's just say he, he's had his fair share of suffering um, outside of his home planet going extinct, or, or whatever happened to it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Infinity War, <laughs> Infinity War is uh, another one of these movies that pretty much has all you could ask for from a movie like that. It's incredible, it's phenomenal, it's got great action, it's got... <sighs> I mean... Oh, right, I forgot, this is a... Uh, uh, 
a, a party supportive move, not a not an attack. And it's pretty useless as well, like It's kind of redundant when, when things like the Fury Ring exist. Alright, I, I just gotta wait this out then. <laughs> so I think I've pretty much said all that there is to say about Infinity War. Um, What's next? Um, Ant-Man and the Wasp is next. Um, so, so far I would say that all of the Phase 3 movies of the MCU have been amazing, but this is the first one that, while still good, I wouldn't say is amazing necessarily, just really, really good. Um, it's probably on the same level of quality as the first Ant-Man, but at the same time, better? It, it's kind of hard for me to explain. I'm not really sure how to explain it. It's like, as good, but it does enough better that it's technically better than the first Ant-Man, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, like... <sighs> like, the villain is sympathetic once again, but not as strong as the uh, other villains we've had so far, although to be fair, we, we have had some tough competition given that Phase 3 gave us Baron Zemo, uh, Killmonger, and Thanos, and Thanos came just before uh, Ghost, so it, it's very hard to compare, can, you know. But still, uh, it's nice to see uh, uh, Hope get introduced as the Wasp, and of course she can fly, so you add that to the, the shrinking abilities of Ant-Man, and, you know, there's really a lot of potential for stuff that could happen here, but, uh, you know, once again, the movie emphasizes a uh, story rather than action, and I don't think the movie suffers from it. But, but certainly, maybe, it, it could have done with perhaps a little more action than it had. Especially given Ant-Man's abilities and the uh, potential that the character with such abilities could have. I just got, got confused there for a second. I would still recommend seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp, but it's certainly not a must-watch movie or anything like that. Um, kind of like the first Ant-Man. Uh, although, you know, narratively, the, the post credit scene is a bit necessary to watch. Although, if you don't watch the movie itself, you'll, you'll have no context for it. So, yeah, by extension, the, the, the movie itself needs to be seen. managed to get the heal off of uh, Red 13. Or on Red 13, rather. So, <laughs> oh boy, the next movie, Captain Marvel. <sighs> this movie it is very controversial to talk about for reasons that I'd rather not get into. I, I'd rather just talk about the movie itself and, and nothing related to the actress playing Captain Marvel or anything that she may or actually did not say, um, but, um, it's for those reasons unrelated to the film that many people consider this to be the, the worst Marvel movie, which is absolute overblown hyperbole. It's nowhere near as bad as the actual worst Marvel movies ever. It's not even worse than the worst MCU films. Uh, like, if we were to talk non-MCU Marvel films, then certainly there's a wide range of films to 
choose from that are worse than Captain Marvel. Far worse than Captain Marvel. Um, but even with regards to just the MCU itself, Captain Marvel isn't among the worst of them. I would say it's, in terms of quality, it's within the range of the low tier Phase 2 film or one of the Phase 1 movies. Um, good, but not mind-blowingly good. Like, not must-watch material, but still enjoyable nonetheless. Like, you won't feel like you wasted your time if you decide to watch this movie. <laughs> it has pretty much all of the same standard qualities that, you know, all these other films have. You know, funny moments, great character interactions, and, uh, and dialogue, and uh, again, another great villain with a, a twist that uh, actually I did not see coming and I actually liked very a lot very much. Um, like, like, uh, <laughs> uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, um, certainly there are problems with the film, but, but, wow. Um, but, the problems with the movie are not related to uh, the, the topics I'd rather not get into when talking about this movie. Um, there, there are problems with with the story or, or certain elements of the writing rather than um, anything related to that. Um, so, yeah, um, pretty much uh, Captain Marvel, good movie. Not necessarily a must-see, but certainly good enough to be considered uh, not a waste of time to, to, to watch. And with that, we have Avengers Endgame, the other big film that people have been waiting for a long time, and the conclusion to the Infinity Saga as we know it. Um, it's definitely a hard choice to pick between this and Infinity War for a uh, best MCU film. I would say Infinity War is better than Endgame, but uh, Endgame definitely is a, a very strong contender because it does end. Uh, it does wrap up everything satisfyingly, and I certainly enjoy the ending a hell of a lot. Like, it's pretty much a very satisfying conclusion to everything, like, <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm repeating myself, but yeah, this is another movie that emphasizes its story rather than the action, and uh, you can certainly see that a lot at the beginning, where, uh, you know, after, um, after the intro, so to speak, um, Actually, a better way to put it is, after the time skip, uh, there's a lot of build-up to what exactly the heroes are going to do to uh, fix the problems that were brought about in Infinity War, and, uh, you know, how everybody's dealing with the fallout of the ending of that movie, and, you know, it's a three-hour movie, so it's very long, and it takes a long time to, to get through all of that, and, uh, I honestly think that the fact that the movie spends a lot of time with the characters, uh, coping with things that happened in Infinity War and the, the losses that they suffered, but those are necessary things for the movie to have, because the, uh, the film would honestly not be as good if it wasn't as long because it didn't have these things in it. So. I would say it definitely worked out for the better, making the movie as long as it is. Um, certainly it's a little more serious than Infinity War, but uh, that's not to say it's devoid of humor or anything like that. There's still plenty of funny moments and memorable character dialogue and interactions and character development and growth. You know, pretty much all the good stuff you could expect, just with a whole lot more characters. And 
Again, this is an extremely satisfying conclusion. You, you probably... It's very hard for me to imagine how they could have ended it better than they did. Okay, that should be about the last thing to break for. Right, 13, yep. I just wanna be sure of this. I know Cosmo Memory is the final limit break for him, but in case I get it wrong. Nice. Okay, three more to go. amazing and I don't think you could have asked for a better ending than, than what it gives. It's simply just, you know, wa watch the, the films in the MCU that are necessary to watch before Endgame and, and then go see Endgame because I think, you know, it, it's, it's good enough to watch just to see how it all ends. You know, it's worth watching the other movies just so you could understand this film, because it's just that good. And then we have what is pretty much the epilogue of, of uh, the Infinity Saga, which is uh, Spider-Man Far From Home. And, uh, again, uh, Spider-Man has different character development in this film than he does in other Spider-Man films. And, uh, in fact, very different from his character development in Homecoming. Um, and for the people who didn't really like, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, there was Stark Tech in Spider-Man's suit in Homecoming, there's much less of it in, in this movie. Although some people would still say that there's too much of it simply because he has, you know, Stark Tech glasses in the movie, but he, he, he hardly really uses them, even though they are uh, highly consequential to the plot. Um, I didn't use the hyper on Sid. God damn it. Well, uh, I'll just have to remember after this battle. It's a one-hit kill anyway. Uh, okay. Alright, I gotta check this uh, real quick. Alright, first use the hyper. Then check his limits. Okay, I'm pretty sure I, I need to... Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, um... Far From Home is definitely another, uh, light-hearted film, but I wouldn't say it's too light-hearted. Like, certainly it's nowhere near the level of, uh, Homecoming, for sure. Um, It's definitely more about uh, Peter Parker's growth as a character and, and dealing with uh, the, the fallout of Avengers Endgame and feeling he has a lot to live up to in, in the wake of those events. And uh, <clears throat> I feel like there, there's a lot more focus on his uh, emotional development and, and, and character growth rather than... Uh, anything related to a fun time or humor or, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but 
like, yeah, uh, other than that, it hits all of the same other marks that the majority of the MCU's, MCU films hit, which is, uh, you know, good character interactions and dialogue, uh, good writing, good, uh, You know, pretty much everything that I already said about these films a, a bunch of times already. You know, it's a it's a film worth watching if you're in it for a good time. <laughs> I, I'm terrible at, 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 at speaking, in case you didn't notice. And I, and I made that clear before, like, I fully admit that. I don't know how to speak from the top of my head, but I do my best. So yeah, um, having, yeah, that's, that's pretty much all of them now. I really, man, and I still got more to do. I, <laughs> I was hoping this, I was hoping I would be able to talk about all of the movies and be finished with it by the time I'm done with, with, with all this farming. But no, instead uh, I got through with talking about all the films and I still got more to do. Regen. Well, actually, I can just mystery kick him since he, he's almost full. Um, I guess I could talk about, you know, the upcoming films and what I'm looking forward to in them. Like, like, so, like obviously, after Endgame, the, the, the hype for the MCU is going to die down, you know. So, it's kind of like we're back at phase one where we're building up momentum again instead of everybody being hyped about every movie that's coming out now. And, uh... Two of the films are of things that many people have never heard of before, like the things only fans of the comics are familiar with, the Eternals and Shang-Chi. And Shang-Chi is actually a character that I, I've never heard of, uh, despite being a Marvel fan, until his movie was announced. So, um, I'm actually looking forward to Shang-Chi because that movie is going to, uh, feature the Mandarin, and, uh, even though it won't be Iron Man facing off against him, I still, uh, am looking forward to it just for that reason alone, um, because that's something that people have wanted for a long time, you know, ever since Iron Man 3, and, uh, I'm not sure if I would be as excited with, without that for Shang-Chi, but uh, nonetheless, I, I look like I, I'm pretty much looking forward to all of the upcoming films, no matter what. But uh, certainly, there are some films I'm looking forward to more than others. Like I'm looking forward to The Eternals next year more than I am Black Widow, because I'm pretty sure Black Widow is. Uh, going to be another one of these films that just adds to the background of the characters and backstory and maybe not necessarily backstory, but just background of the MCU. Uh, certainly we'll, we'll see events that we only heard about in, in uh, previous films. And that's going to be enjoyable to see, hopefully. 
I, I said, given the quality of, of all these other films so far, I don't really have any reason to believe that this will be the first one. I mean, granted, the, the first trailer hasn't dropped yet, but... Again, the, all of these films, even the worst ones, I wouldn't consider to be bad movies. Average at worst, but nonetheless, you know, I, I look forward to Black Widow, even if it's not the thing I'm most excited for. I, I'm actually looking forward to Eternals more because even though that's looking to also be another uh, movie ex expanding on the background and, and, and lore and, and and world building of the MCU, um, it will be far more connected to everything than Black Widow will be. So, uh, and and who knows? Maybe we might see Thanos again. We might get more background on Thanos. We might we might see what exactly happened to his home planet. Who knows? There, there's a lot of potential for for things that that we could see in the Eternals, so that I'm definitely Okay, I, I, I'll definitely want to end the battle with that just to see what that is. Um, but, you know, aside from the movies, they've also got shows on Disney Plus as well. And those I'm looking forward to. Again, the, the degree of which I'm looking forward to the to the uh, shows varies depending on what they are. Like, excuse me, maybe uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier. I don't know. Like, it could be. It's hard for me to explain. I'm having a hard time talking right now. Um, I, like I'm having a hard time even remembering what all the Disney Plus shows are going to be. Uh, I know WandaVision is one, and I'm certainly looking forward to that because it's going to be... It's going to play into uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, and... Uh, certainly it's going to be worth watching just to see how it connects to that movie. Uh, and that's Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness is one of the ones I'm looking forward to the most. Uh, given how amazing the first Doctor Strange film was, certainly the second one can only be better, right? And it is going to explore the multiverse, so things can only get even more crazier than they already were in the first film. So I'm definitely going to want to see that. It, it certainly seems like it will be an essential watch for understanding the narrative. And, you know, that's, those are the films that get me excited more than anything else. Because I'm pretty sure now that, you know, Disney and Marvel own the movie rights to the Fantastic Four again, that Galactus is going to be the villain that they're going to want to build up to. Uh, I don't think he's going to be the Phase 5 uh, ultimate villain, so to speak, but rather Phase 6, maybe? We'll see. Um, but that's uh, certainly a long ways off from now. Like, like I can't even begin to uh, think about what film might be the beginning that, that leads into building up to Galactus. Like, it could be the Eternals. It could be Doctor Strange and the multiverse of, multiverse of Madness. We don't know. And, you know, if they're going to start to build up Galactus, to me, it, it should be in a Fantastic Four movie rather than an unrelated film. But again, you know, Eternals is going to be connected to everything, and... Galactus is a huge cosmic presence, not just in terms of his size, but also in terms of the impact that he has in uh, the story of the comics. So, of course, he's going to have a large impact on the MCU when he finally makes his debut. I mean, 
certainly they, they might have some trouble explaining like where was he all along, but given how they, they that they've handled the explanations for other things, uh, I, I'm not too worried about it personally. Like I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll, they'll find some way to explain what, why he hasn't shown up until now in a way that, that makes sense, you know what I mean? Like the universe is big and so they could just explain it as he just simply hasn't found his way to Earth yet. Until now. You know? So, who knows? You know, maybe they could tie in the events to Infinity War and Endgame as part of the explanation for why Galactus hasn't shown up yet. You know, maybe the events of, th the events of those films are what made him catch his attention to Earth and stuff like that. You know? There's a lot of ways that they could handle it. But, again, that's a long ways off from now. Like, they didn't even announce w when they could potentially release the Fantastic Four, uh, reboot, so... For now, let's just, uh, stick to what we do know is coming in the near future, and, uh... Let's see... Mention Black... What do I mention? Uh... Black Strange... Shang-Chi... Um... Certainly, of the films that are coming out in, I believe it's 2021, uh, Shang-Chi is probably the one that I'm looking forward to the least, but again, I'm looking forward to all these films, so that's not really saying much of anything. Um... Really, the, the thing that, that draws me to Shang-Chi the most is the fact that he's going to be facing off against the Mandarin, so I admit I'm not sure if I would be as, as, as excited without that aspect. But I am still looking forward to the film regardless, nonetheless, and, uh... You know, it, it is a new character, and we are going to have new... to have to have new faces, uh introduced in order to uh, replace the, the, the ones that we lost and uh, certainly there is some question as to whether or not the film can really be successful given it had, it's an unknown character but considering how well Captain Marvel did when she was not previously introduced in any other films I, I'm pretty sure Shang-Chi will do just fine as well And then, uh, the other film... Oh yeah, that's right! They did announce another Spider-Man movie for 2021, because, uh... Initially, Sony, uh, didn't want to continue the deal with Marvel, even though they said that they, they would continue it if Spider-Man Far From Home made a billion dollars, and it did, and, uh... They... they they decided not to continue the deal to allow Spider-Man in the MCU, but then, you know, <laughs> the fan backlash to, to that news was immediate and massive, and I'm actually surprised that Sony uh, caved in and re-allowed Spider-Man back into the MCU as quickly as they did, because... <laughs> Man, it, it was only a few weeks that he was out of the MCU, but they were the longest few weeks um, that I have experienced in a long time because it felt like he he was out of the MCU for sure. There was no way in hell he was coming back, and then in just a few weeks, he did come back, and it's great. It's fantastic that um, he's back in the MCU because the way Far From Home ends, it would have been absolutely terrible to continue that version of Spider-Man except without any mention of any of the previous films that he was in prior. And especially given how massive of a cliffhanger that, that, that Far From Home ends on, you know what I mean? So, while the MCU didn't necessarily need Spider-Man per se, um, Certainly, it's to the benefit of both the MCU's narrative and, uh, business-wise, that, that he's still in the MCU, so, you know, 
good for Sony, good for Disney that they managed to work things out, but most importantly, good for us, the fans, because we're actually going to see uh, this version of Spider-Man's story in the MCU conclude. Um, I think there's one or two other films that he's going to also be in after the third Spider-Man movie, so we'll, we'll see what, what happens there. It, you know, it could be into the multiverse of madness, who knows, but we'll have to see what happens in the third Spider-Man movie, whatever it's going to be called, and we'll have to see what happens in the other movies, whatever happens, you know, there, because you never know when unrelated films could have an effect on other movies. Um, so with that, the only other film in the future <clears throat> to talk about is Thor Love and Thunder, and Again, this is another one of those movies that is getting a lot of negative backlash. Well, that's redundant. Backlash is really all I need to say. Uh, it's getting a lot of backlash for reasons I'd rather not talk about, and, uh... Rest assured, it's uh, once again completely unwarranted. I'm pretty sure the movie is not going to be anything like what people who are complaining about it are expecting it to be like. Excuse me. Wait. Oh, shit. I, I guess when the material leveled up, uh, it also overrided the, uh, well, I guess I could see what this looks like. <laughs> this? <sighs> what was I talking about again? Oh yeah, no, Thor Love and Thunder. Um. Oh. Yeah, that's right. There's four MC movies coming out in 2021, and, uh... I would say, uh... Oh, that's the wrong... Well, it didn't matter. It hit anyway. Yeah, because of, of Spider-Man being added to 2021, there's four MCU films coming out, and, uh... I would say Thor Love and Thunder is either hmm, number two or number three on my list of looking forward to the most. Um, okay. Alright, only two more left to go, and then I can be done for the night. <clears throat> so yeah, uh... Once again, overblown negative backlash that's completely undeserved. Um, certainly the movie's not going to be as bad as people are expecting it to be if it's going to have the same director as Thor Ragnarok. And, uh, especially given how... Uh, the MCU films are often completely different, or at the very least, very different from the source material. Um, I have no reason to believe that the film is going to turn out badly for any reason. Like, I trust, uh, Taito Waikiki or, or, or whatever his name is to do a good job with the movie. Like, I have- I don't doubt him for a second. He did a good job with Ragnarok, so why would he do a bad job with this one? You know what I mean? I know that's very, uh, simple logic, and it doesn't always apply all the time, but... Again... Like... They've been able to maintain a high standard of quality for- for... The MCU so far, so they're obviously going to strive to continue that going forward. 
And given where Thor is in the MCU now, after everything he's been through, now is the best time for um, this uh, story to be told, honestly. And uh, I don't necessarily think uh, Jane, like, obviously, yes, they, they are setting up Jane to take Thor's place in the MCU after he, like, I'm pretty sure he's going to make his exit in, come on, select Vincent, what the hell, there we go, and I forgot to use the hyper again, <sighs> every time. Having such a hard time targeting Vincent. Um, but yeah, um, for Love and Thunder, I'm pretty sure it's gonna turn out to be great. Maybe Beta Ray Bill might finally make his debut. That that would be a great thing to see if it finally happens. I mean, I doubt it, but you never know. And <sighs> you're good. <sighs> Man, I I've even gone through talking about the movies that are coming up next, and I'm still not done with this. I actually should probably be farming, uh, Yuffies. I mean, I could... Oh, good. Oh, God, I didn't even... Wait a minute. Wait a second. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, I, I got kind of, I'm pretty sure it still works the same way even though it's a transformation and not an attack or a move. You know what, I, I think I'm going to... ...move Vincent to the, just to the, to the back way, just so he's easier to target. Well, I mean, they did announce a Blade reboot. That's... I haven't seen the original Blade movies, but I'm still looking forward to the reboot regardless. And I will be watching the original trilogy before um, watching the, the, the reboot. If anything, just so. I mean, I, I don't really need to compare it to the original trilogy, but... Certainly, it would make me more familiar with the character since the only thing of... Excuse me. The only thing of Blade that I've seen, really, is, uh... Uh, Blade from the, uh... Spider-Man animated series that was a fox. Other than that, I'm not really familiar with, with Blade at all, other than what his character is. I kind of wish they would have gotten uh, Wesley Snipes to reprise his role, even if he might be too old to play it at this point, but still. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe he could still be in the movie in some capacity, cameoing as a, another character or whatever, but I don't know, we'll see. I, su I suppose, you know, it will be fine with, with who they did get to play Blade, and I'm pretty sure the Blade reboot is coming before the Fantastic Four and the X-Men reboots, given how they already cast an actor uh, to play Blade, and they have, in fact, already announced him, and they haven't announced anybody for Fantastic Four or X-Men yet, so... And, uh... 
Speaking of the X-Men reboot, um, there are some concerns that I have regarding it, though I have enough faith in, in Kevin Feige to, to do the right thing and do a good job with the reboot, like, I'm pretty sure he knows not to screw it up, like, people have been, well, the, the health bar kind of bled into the the thing bar, the, the MP bar, for a second there. Um, really, the only concern that that there is about the X Men reboot is, is the branding. Like, he 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 didn't say X Men specifically. He said that they would be focusing on mutants in the MCU. That's got people worried that they're not going to be called X Men anymore. But I'm pretty sure Feige knows that. You know, if you change the brand name, that it would basically be the same kind of backlash that the whole Spider-Man of the MCU deal got, you know? So he wouldn't do that. He's smart enough to know not to do that. You know, they've been called the X-Men for so long that you can't change the name now. They're the X-Men no matter what. It would not be as... Yeah. I, I'm just... I'm pretty confident that he knows better than to change the name for seemingly arbitrary reasons. Fantastic Four reboot, um... <clears throat> I mean... Not only do I think that the Fantastic Four reboot will be better than all of the other Fantastic Four movies that we've gotten before, um, and, and given how how bar how low the bar is in that regard, it's certainly going to be the best one. But uh, it may even go as far as to end up as the definitive version of the Fantastic Four. Like, as far as adaptive media goes. Like, obviously, the source material, yes, the source material will always be there and will always be the, you know, definitive version. Ah, oh, you only switched between. You know what? I, I am gonna check this real quick, because I, I, I want to be sure of it. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the Fantastic Fa uh, Reboot, Fantastic Four Reboot is going to be great. It, they're going to be the most comic accurate versions of the characters we've seen before. Not necessarily sure if Doctor Doom is going to be the villain in it. He, he certainly could be, but I think it might be better to uh, build up to him rather than have him debut immediately. Because, again, it's another one of these things where he, he was the villain in, in the last two incarnations uh, of the movie versions of these characters. So people might sort of need a break from Dr. Doom, and then, you know, you ease into him uh, as, you, as you go along. Uh, apparently, the, the Dr. Doom movie that was in development at Fox but before Disney bought them would still continue to be in development after they completed the deal. Uh, So, we would probably see uh, Doctor Doom debut in his own movie rather than as a Fantastic Four villain. I mean, he's still going to be a Fantastic Four villain, obviously, but... 
Oh, okay, so... Alright, looks like... <clears throat> I don't need Vincent in my party at all. I can just... Alrighty then. Well, that was a waste of time. Very unfortunate, but whatever. I, I did farm some of Yuffie's uh, limit breaks a bit, so it wasn't a complete waste of time. Yes, it is the one that I... Actually, I did want... I am going to change the order here. <clears throat> Actually, I should give you Phoebe's material. Supposed to use chaos on Vincent. Wait, I already saved, so. Yes. Now I just need to get Goofies and we're done here. I cannot wait to be done here. Jesus Christ. This has been going on for so long. It's gone on for so long that I actually have run, run out of movies to talk about now because I've discussed all the movies that came out and the ones that are coming out in the future that we know of at least. Um, like I'm pretty sure I don't have a nip on. Okay, so, supposedly Deadpool 3 is in development. I, I think they said it, it was supposed to be in the MCU, but... Or, maybe they didn't? Like, I'm not entirely sure whether or not... Like, I'm not even sure if they're sure if it's going to be in the MCU. But, I mean, it could be, like... Given how Deadpool 2 ended, certainly that is grounds for uh, how they could introduce him into the MCU, especially with uh, what happens in Endgame. <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure how they're going to connect uh, Deadpool to the MCU, or, you know, like, apparently it's even up in the air, whether or not if it will actually be Ryan Reynolds still playing him, but nonetheless. Oh, I should have uh, 
and nip on someone else. Again, this is another one of those things where I'm pretty sure they're smart enough to know that people... Like, Deadpool is successful because it's Ryan Reynolds playing him, so... They, they recast him and that takes away a huge part of the reason why they like him and why they liked him in the first place, so... It would be a very bad idea for them to... Um, recast Ryan Reynolds, but at the same time, you know, this also goes with, you know, do they keep him R-rated or do they downgrade him to PG-13 because it's going to be his introduction to the MCU, if not outright already in the MCU. You know, I say again that I trust them to not screw it up, but Certainly, I can understand why people are concerned. Um, but I'm sure that how whatever they do, it'll be good, regardless. Let's see. She should have comments. We're almost done, everybody. We're almost done. Oh. Oh boy. And, and now I realize that having a minute on cloud is a... And this is what happens when I uh, attempt to multitask, but my brain is not at the capacity for multitasking. Some means I gotta change equipment. Mm. 
just to be sure. Okay. Because last time, uh, a material leveled up at the same time that I gained a limit break, and that caused the, the limit break level up to be hidden, and I didn't realize that it leveled up. And even though a, a, a character leveled up shouldn't hide a, a limit break level up, I, I had to be sure. Turbo Ethers. Spoken about all the movies I, I, I wanted to speak about. I just, I'm so tired. I just want to finish this and go to sleep.
I know I... Safe to save. All creation. Yes. Finally. We did it. Yay. We have all the final limit breaks. God, that took forever. I really didn't want this stream to go on for as long as it did. Man, I'm glad it's finally over. Uh, what do I even want to do now? Like, I don't know. Huh? I guess I'll just save here and you know, organize all my items and stuff. Now that I'm done with farming, I can give it. Well, no, that's not true actually. I need to. I need to give everybody equipment for. Well, no, because the next thing I'm going to do is fight the bonus bosses, and I'm going to need. I do want some material growth at least. This is... the setup is good enough. Um, but I will have to... ...reset up everybody's materia in preparation for the big battles that are going to be happening.
away. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. That way I don't have to worry about setup for the next stream. But yeah, that, that's gonna be it for me for tonight. I am very tired. I'm gonna go straight to sleep right after I cut stream here. So, uh, thank you all for watching. Thank you once again to Tyronix Gamer for the host and for Sacred Blood Lord for dropping by. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm probably gonna play Payday 2 again uh, if I stream Saturday, which is when I plan to do my next stream. Uh, and uh, then I'll be. It'll be back to this on Monday, and uh, we'll be fighting the bonus bosses, the Ultima, uh, Ultima Weapon, Emerald Weapon, and Ruby Weapon. Not sure if we're going to do all three in one stream, but I'm certainly going to try. So yeah, with that... Thank you all for watching, and see you next time.